What would your business look like if you were able to get rid of all of the lower level mundane tasks that we do every day and only focus on those high value, high dollar activities that really drive that growth and that revenue and that profit and that scale that so many of us want. I know that I'm guilty of doing things every single week that I know I shouldn't be doing and I just haven't delegated them, I haven't outsourced them, I haven't automated them yet. Well, my guest today, Adam Patterson of SMA Support, is someone who has helped many, many roofing, contracting, and home service companies to implement systems that free up our time so that we can get those mundane tasks off our plate so we can systemize and process those things and focus on those revenue driving, those business growth activities that we all wanna do. Man, Adam is a wealth of knowledge, very intelligent guy, speaks fast. You might have to rewind the episode, make sure that you have something to take notes with right here and uh, you're gonna learn a lot. I learned a lot. I've got the gears spinning in my head after having this conversation with Adam. I might wanna hire them for Contractor Dynamics to help us process more of our business so that I can go out there and grow our business at a higher level. So Adam is someone that is, uh, again, has a lot of experience, a lot of expertise. So make sure that you tune in and make sure that you grab a nugget or two that you can really, really implement in your business to help you get unstuck and unlock that next level of growth. All right, what's going on, Adam? Uh, pumped to have you here. How are you today? I'm doing well, Joe. How are you doing? I'm doing fantastic. I'm excited to dig into uh, a lot of good stuff today, but first things first, man, you've got a really cool shirt on. What's going on there? Yeah, fair. I appreciate that. So I've got a uh, big bird hunter. I've got a couple of German wirehead pointers, one named Paul Pierce. He's all my dogs are named after famous Boston Celtics. The other name, uncle and niece. Um, so I've been bird hunting with them for a while. The older one's gun shy. He's not as into it anymore. I go up to Maine where it's good and quiet. Great uh, quail and pheasant season as well. So, um, but you know, when I'm not hunting, uh, I do love birds. So uh, this is where I came across this shirt in some store at some point in my life. Uh, and I had to have it. The rest is history. Fantastic. I love that. So you are, you live in Massachusetts or Maine or where are you at? I do. I'm uh, just outside of Boston here in Massachusetts. As I, much as I would love to Maine, live in Maine and lived in Maine uh, for a handful of years, it's uh, not easy to get anywhere else in the country living in Maine. So <laughs> mm, That's true. That's true. I've driven up there a couple of times from Jersey in my previous career uh, in the maritime industry. So we used to visit the ports and uh, Bath and Portland and all those. It's a, it's a hike up there. It is. Yeah, it's, it is. It's a couple hours. It's a little bit, I talk about it often like a time machine right? It's like going back in time a good 15 or 20 years. Yeah, true, true. I remember, I mean, obviously they're famous for lobster, but I remember the blueberries, like we went in August, I guess. And like everywhere you go, there's these roadside stands with like blueberry, like, like big buckets of blueberries. Yeah. I think there's some wild, wild statistic, like 25% of all blueberries in North America are cultivated in Maine. So. Wow. All right. See, we really have some breath on this Nailed It podcast, guys. You guys thought you're going to learn about the business of construction, but I mean, these are actual facts that you can take to any cocktail party and sound really smart. So another piece of trivia is that out of UNC University of Maine, I went to Boston College and both really good hockey teams. Uh, I didn't play. Did you play hockey in college? Absolutely not. No, no I never <laughs> no. played hockey besides street hockey, but they're uh, both competing now to... Uh, to, on the road to the national championship, right? They are, yeah. And I actually, amazingly enough, I was uh, visiting a client in South Dakota and woke up in South Dakota in the morning this past week, uh, hopped on an airplane, flew back to Boston in time to watch me and unfortunately lose in the hockey semifinals <laughs> um, here at the Boston Garden. But yeah, I'm a big, big Maine Black Bear fan, so. Awesome, awesome. Yeah, the, uh, we won my sophomore year in college. Uh, BC won a national championship. It was awesome. It was so cool to be a part of. It. I wasn't there, but just being on campus was fun. So fun. Yeah, I think you're about to do it again. So all right, we'll see. We'll see. By the time this episode airs, we might uh, we, we might know the outcome. That's how that's how this stuff works. So <laughs> anyway, we're gonna dig into processes. We're gonna dig into what makes roofing companies really grow. Technology, systems, outsourcing, all that fun stuff. Maybe not fun, maybe not the sexy stuff of business, but this is really where businesses are built because processes equal growth and processes equal freedom. And we're going to get into that with Adam today. So Adam, just give the audience a little bit of a background as to who you are. You and I just got to know each other through our mutual friend and colleague, Joe Hoffman, and uh, excited to have you on. So give the audience a little bit of a background. 
Yeah. Yeah. So I'll give you a background. I'll actually use the story of how I got into roofing. I think will be a, a good highlight of that and why I'm here today. Yeah. Yeah. We all have a story, right? Indeed. Yes. Yeah. So I owned uh, and was a managing partner in a consulting agency here in Boston uh, with a couple of close counterparts, good friends, folks that were uh, significantly more experienced, uh, well-versed uh, and intellectually capable than I was and willing to teach me uh, and bring me along. And so uh, we worked with private equity and venture capital funds uh, on high growth, high velocity businesses. So I uh, said differently when a fund made a series A or a series B round investment, and they wanted the top line revenue of that uh, new portfolio company to grow three to 500% in a short period of time, three years or less, uh, we would get hired and instituted to help them build revenue strategy, go to market strategy, talent strategy, operating hygiene, all the things in the systems in the back end that made this business hit these accelerated growth outcomes. All really important and interesting things to us. Typically, we'd get companies that had been through that zero to one million, right? That's that hardest phase of growth. And now all of a sudden, we're one to five, five to seven. We're getting different kinds of pains. What we know is the things that got us here won't get us there. Uh, and we want to understand how we better arm and institute our business to hit that next phase of uh, growth and escape velocity, right? So I was speaking at a conference years ago, and a gentleman came up to me after the conference and said, hey, I just want you to know, you know, what you're doing in these software companies, it seems very cool. It seems to be working really well. It's pretty impressive. I have a feeling it'd work even better for you in roofing. Uh, and I laughed at him. There's, there's no way, you know, I would look great in a Lamborghini, but I can't treat I, I don't know anything about these industries. I know nothing about these businesses. Uh, there's a lot of like foundational level things that I need to institute and understand myself. So at the time, this is four or five years ago, I did some primary market research. Actually, it's the first time I met Joe. So I was trying to get an understanding, meet some roofing company owners, meet some bigger or growing roofing company owners to understand their businesses a little bit better. Uh, the last two years specifically, I've worked uh, hand in hand with the team at Advocate Construction. Uh, so Doug and Nick uh, out of Illinois, as they've hit some pretty accelerated growth drives. Uh, and for me, it was a lot about getting very hands on and learning this industry a little bit deeper. Uh, and the more in the weeds I got, I had this thing in the back of my mind that I remembered, which was Joe Hoffman said, we've been using this business process outsourcing firm that's completely revolutionized my business years ago. And I think it might make sense for other roofers. And I said, that's interesting. And I'll keep that in mind as we kind of plug through. And the more I peeled back the layers of this business, the more I saw a couple of things that, hey, the Joe is exactly right. Uh, and he had difficulty articulating it. And I think that folks had difficulty understanding where that fit was. Uh, and for me, it just fit like a, a puzzle piece. The other thing I started to notice, frankly, was that you know when I thought about and looked at the pockets of software companies that had these huge growth outcomes, like hit this accelerated growth, they had a handful of things in common. One was that their reps that were hired there, particularly at that phase pre-growth, every one of them made a lot of money. It wasn't like a couple of guys once did it and they got lucky. It was like, no, everybody that came in and worked hard is going to make six figures, if not more. There were some folks that were making four, five, six, seven, right? crazy outcomes, but you know, it was a reflection of their work. And if they were willing to work hard, they would achieve that. And I think that roofing, from my perspective, is a, a great earning democratization business, right? It, it, it is possible for anybody. If you come in and you put the effort forward and you've got the right systems around you, you'll make six figures. Well, more, you'll make more money than you know what to do with. And all of a sudden it's like, I feel rewarded and recognized for what I'm contributing. Uh, so I found that to be very true in roofing. Now, the second thing that these companies all had in common was that there was a tendency that they believed in something bigger than themselves. And they're all working toward a shared outcome, something much bigger than individual accomplishment. And I find that very true in all roofing companies, right? We are here for storm and restoration to advocate on behalf of our homeowner uh, to help, you know, coach them through a process of filing in a claim and ensuring that, you know, we're delivering and driving the best outcome for them and their asset uh, or in the other end of that continuum, right? We're working with a homeowner who is empowering us to help them to repair uh, or replace a most integral point, a the most integral component of the most important investment they'll ever make in their life. And so, you know, it's a dynamic relationship where the homeowner is the most important person in your world with every single homeowner because you're helping them with their most important thing. Uh, so that foundational truth was there in my experience in every single roofing company. And the other big thing that these companies all had in common was velocity. There was a lot happening at once all the time, right? They were busy. There was no time to kind of not be intellectually stimulated, no time to get bored. You always had something to do in these hyper growth companies. And that is most certainly true in roofing. <laughs> so yes, um, that is kind of now that I've understood the business a little bit better, um, I'm, I'm here and I'm, uh, I think, going to take this approach to the masses. So. 
All right. Fantastic. That's really cool. Uh, so that gentleman that first saw you at that conference was like, man, this would work really well in roofing. He saw those things. Is that someone that's, that is a roofing company owner or just kind of on the periphery of the industry? Yeah, it was a gentleman who's on the periphery of the industry. It had been in home services for a period of time. It worked in kitchens, floorings, cabinets. Um, so, and I think it had a friend running a roofing company and it was supporting that friend in that journey. He happened to be an attendee at this conference and uh, I will forever be indebted. <laughs> yeah, him. seriously. It's crazy how like I think about that when I'm in rooms or events or working with clients. I'm like, yeah, all of the kind of serendipity that goes into like and you know where we end up and who we're working with, you and I here on this podcast. It's just like different little relationships, right? It's uh it's so interesting. And and uh Adam is mentioning Joe for the audience. We're talking about Joe Hoffman, who is one of the founders of Hoffman Weber Construction. Uh, you know, big established roofing company, also the founder of SMA Support. We'll get we'll get into now. I believe the founder, and also the founder of Roofal, which a lot of you are familiar with in the roofing industry. And uh, Joe is an awesome leader, and he is someone that uh, I was just texting with him this morning about you, Adam. And he's like, yeah, I just I really focus on trying to find people that are smarter than me, that can articulate things, that can really just take things and run with them. And that's what it takes to be a leader and to really have an impact. So Joe Hoffman, awesome guy. Make sure you look him up. Yeah. Yeah. Joe is, Joe is great. I've worked a ton from Joe. Uh, and he's made me laugh probably more than any individual I've worked with uh, <laughs> over the last 20 years of my career. So I'm grateful for that. Fantastic. All right. Well, Joe, if you're listening, man, we love you. And uh, we're going to talk about your company now. So what is SMA support, Adam? And you're the business development director. Is that it? I am. Yeah, I'm really uh, kind of helping to right size this business and get us focused on growth. And, and so part of that looks like how do we make sure that the kinds of training programs that we have for our staff and for our team are adding as much value as they can, but for our organization as well as our clients, uh, how do we ensure that we are uh, not just pretty good, not just pretty great, but perfect every time we are executed on behalf of our clients? Uh, and how do we ensure that we can scale that aggressively, rapidly, and consistently uh, across the work clients and customers that we work with? Uh, a big part of it is narrow narrowing down our value message, right? And I think actually it would help if I tell you why I do what I do. I uh, have been blessed with um, intellectual capacity in this life and probably an opportunity to do dozens of things if I so choose. I am here today because I think I have an opportunity to make a pretty cool impact in two corners of the world. Now, and the first of that is for these roofing company owners, many of whom I'm sure listen to your podcast, that started their roofing companies because they thought, I want to have a little bit more time with my family and I want to have more resources available to do things with my family that I can't do now, right? We want to go to Disney every year. We want to take vacations. I want to get a lake house. I want to get a boat, right? I want to make sure I'm in Little League practice every day. And uh, all of a sudden we hit that one to two million. We're a new business. It feels easier than it should be. We think, great, this is awesome, right? Now we're starting to go to two to three to four to five million and our time is vanishing away, right? We thought we were going to be at every little league practice and all of a sudden we're working 90 hours a week. You know, I might have solved that financial resource problem, but now I've got significantly less time. And so the reasons that I started this business aren't coming to life. Uh, and I think that there's two paths that, that folks tend to go down. There's the, you know, forget my family. This is a lot of fun. I'm going to continue to do this. Or there's the forget the business. My family's what's important. I'm going to step back and we're going to be stuck. Right. And I don't think that either of those are ideal outcomes for those owners. So what I see this as really is a way for us to empower owners to do the things that only they can do that they do best and to spend their time really wisely. Right. I want to empower a roofing company owner to live the dream that he started this journey on, uh, which was I'm running a hyper efficient, hyper scaled, um, hyper optimized business that allows me to spend time with my family, to provide back the resources that I had hoped to my family that reduces and lowers my risk uh, in operating this company and um, lets me do just what I do best and what only I can do, right? The other big thing for me is that the impact that we make with our team in the Philippines. So we've got a, a few operating principles. Um, the first of those is we pay significantly more than other BPO firms do overseas. So a part of that is because the difference in pay for us here uh, in the US dollar is not terribly significant. That difference is tremendously significant in the Philippines. And it goes so far as to say, we've got folks that are on our teams that have come in and said things to the effect of, you know, I'm almost 30 years old. Uh, my entire life, my mother has been in prostitution. And uh, I now have the resources available to pull her out of that life, to have her live in our home, to uh, bring our family together. Uh, things that are just, uh, you can't really do. Right. You can't have those same kinds of impacts professionally through work and to the two corners of the market. Um, so there are two pieces of the world that I think we're really making a positive impact in. Um, and, you know, there are 
multiple lives that we, by extension, have an opportunity to change. And that why is what keeps me coming back to this work. That why is why I got out of bed last night at 11 p.m. and hopped on a phone call with a client, right? Um, so so it fuels you. You will seek that work out uh, if you really fundamentally believe in what you're doing. Dude, that's awesome. Absolutely. We we go into that a lot in our, our mastermind group that we run for contractors. And we start everything out with your vivid vision. Like, what do you want and why? Because as you know, Adam, and the audience knows, this stuff is not easy. Business is extremely difficult. It's stressful. It's full of self-doubt, low bank accounts, sleepless nights. Like, There's a lot that goes into entrepreneurship. And if you don't have that, it, it sounds cliche, but you know, cliches are cliche for a reason, right? Because they're true. If you don't have that why that's pulling you through those days where you're tired, you don't want to wake up, you don't want to do it. Uh, for example, today, I'm, I'm pretty exhausted, but like I got a full 12 hour day and I'm plowing through it and I'm excited about it because we have that big vision, right? And if you don't have that, you're just not going to be, like I said before, you're not going to be consistent, which is really what, you know, one of the key ingredients for any business, right? Yeah. Consistency is, is critically important. Consistency is one of the most important things that you can focus on. You know, I look at you know, why is, is really important. I also look at like what can happen and I consider roofing to be a high noise, high velocity business. What tends to happen to operators within that space, right? We, we instinctively respond to the noise around us. And that's sort of, it's human psychology. Your brain is going to, you're wired. One of the great things in evolution and we call it evolutionary baggage, right? If you see someone in distress, there's a part of your brain that goes, I want to help that person. And 200,000 years ago, that helped our species survive. Right, we the the ones that were more likely to help others are more likely to continue to proliferate, and that's why that comes so naturally to all of us today, right? But uh, it also means that you've got a hard coded evolutionary response, which is when I see someone in distress or a situation that reflects distress, I'm likely to try and help and and solve that problem. And what we tend to do when we do that, right, is we continue to create a environment where chaos can thrive. We're not solving chaos, we're not curing chaos, we're prolonging chaos because I'm making the environment incredibly suitable for more chaos, right? And I want to help owners, I want to help operators in these businesses pull themselves out of that the moment of chaos. You talked a moment ago about like, you know, what, what do you focus on and what's your vision? There's an exercise I encourage folks to go through. And I call it the column A, column B, and column C exercise. In column A, I say, I want you to list out all the things that are, you know, your value adds. These are the things that only you can do. These are the things that are most important for you, that add incredible amount of value back to your team, to your business, to your culture, to your operation. They require you. You could never find another person in the world to do these things. And in column B, I want you to put all the noise, right? This is all the noise, the kind of bullshit, the things that anybody could do, but you find yourself doing because you respond in the moment, because you're habitual about it, because this is just where we are, how we've always done it. And make that list really long, right? Every single little thing that pulls you away. It could be a thing that's 30 minutes a day. It could be a thing that's four hours once a month. It could be two hours a week, right? But you should know what all of those kind of gaps to execution and those blind spots are. In column C, which is kind of the differentiator, is what are all the things that you wish you could do that you know would add a lot of value back to your company and to your team, but you can't do because B is way too long. And the goal of the exercise, right, is how do I hyper-focus my time in A? How do I move C to A? And how do I shorten B? Right? And that's where SMA fits in, is all of those things that are kind of the repeatable, regurgitating tasks, the noise that has to happen in the business. And that could be lead response from lead aggregators. It could be scheduling production. It could be COIs and subcontractors. It could be, you know, accounting. It could be commissions. It could be payables. It could be material ordering. There's a lot of things that if we're really earnest with ourselves, they don't need us or our teams here to do. Uh, our team should be focused on strategic things that move the needle for our companies. So, Man, I've done all those things that you just listed already today. It's only noon. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> just kidding. We are, uh, we're super aligned, man. We're an EOS company. So, um, this is one of the EOS books. Uh, there's seven EOS books and I'm preparing uh, training for our mastermind group later today or in an hour and a half. So I was just referencing that and it's very similar as that exercise you're talking about. I love that column C. I'm just looking down at my notebook, taking notes here. That column C of things that like we want to do and we've always kind of envisioned ourselves doing as that visionary, that owner, but we just never, like we don't, we don't have time to do that, right? We don't find the time and we got to make the time and partnering up with a company like yours or, you know, delegating, elevating, hiring people as a way to create that time that we don't have, right? Yeah. Time affluence is the greatest gift that you can give back to your business and to anyone that works for you. Give them time and empower them and you're going to be amazed at what they accomplish for you. Dude, you've got like all these cool phrases I'm writing down. Time affluence. I love that. Cool. So 
SMA support, like what exactly do you guys do? I love that you started with the why. I love that you started with the impact. I love that you are, everything you've talked about so far is so hyper-focused on your client, which is the roofing or home service company. Awesome place to start. What is it exactly that you guys do? Yeah, it's a great question. So we take, the, in short, we take all of that operational organizational noise, those things that anyone can do, and we empower them with the team in the Philippines that we train based on your standard operating procedures. Uh, we build training manuals, decision trees, outliers, and we get that work repeated consistently, productively, uh, and efficiently. Uh, so those look like things like, as an example, in high velocity business, you want your your revenue generator spending 80 to 90% of their time selling. They should be spending almost all their time generating more revenue. And anything they're not doing generating revenue costs you a lot more money than you might conceptualize. An example of that could be, I'm in storm restoration. I've got a salesperson who's door knocking. We've got a signed contract. Now I've got to call Allstate and get an adjuster appointment, right? Do I want my sales rep spending two hours on the phone with Allstate to schedule an adjuster appointment and then missing two inspections and missing one contract and missing one sale and missing $15,000? Is it worth $15,000 for me to have that salesperson call Allstate? Or could I kind of just have anybody call Allstate and book the appointment if they have access to the calendar, right? So now all of a sudden, what if I'm getting like three more sales a week per rep? What if I have 15 reps? Like my top line is growing pretty substantially, right? So it can tend to look like things like that. Okay. That makes a lot of sense. So I I am, you know, maybe a typical listener of this show, okay? $3 million, $5 million a year roofing company. I'm like, great, Adam, that sounds like a dream. I've got some killers out there. I want them to sell 80 to 90% of the time. How do I close that gap? How, like, how, how do I get from where I am now to like that dream scenario? And here's where a lot of our clients and a lot of our like mastermind members will actually one of them just posted in our group yesterday. It's like, hey, I, I need to hire a VA. Anyone have any suggestions on how to do that? So like, there's this huge gap between like where you are now and that dream scenario. And for like the average company, it's like, all right, well, what do I do? Do I go on Upwork and go hire people? Do I like post in my local Facebook group? Do I, you yeah. know, how how do I don't know? Like, I don't have processes to be able to hire that person, to train that person, to hold them accountable, to work with that person. So you guys kind of handle all that, huh? Yeah, you're leading into my value proposition, Joe, which are uh, two, two big things, right? What makes this very different? One, as a business, we're focused on home services. So as a part of our normalization program, you are not teaching our team about your industry. You're not teaching our team about what it is in roofing. You're not teaching them about how this business tends to work. We've done that for 90 days as we've onboarded. So they know roofing, they know construction, they know general contracting, they know terms and concepts. They might even have experience using some of the tools. Yep. Uh, so instead of spending two months trying to find time to teach your business and your industry to a virtual assistant, they're coming primed, uh, ready to go, ready to take off. Uh, the other big thing that we do that's very different uh, is just the way that we take our reps. Um, first, our reps are all client dedicated and focused. So one thing I'd encourage you to think about, and whether or not you use SMA or another firm, it is, this is an employee of yours that's just, you know, working remote, right? And so like any remote employee, I would want to make sure that mm, they're not working for four or five other contractors at once, right? Which can be the case in a lot of these big VA shops and places you find on Google. They work concurrent contracts um, because they're more valuable back to that company. If they're working for four or five people at once, we never do that. Uh, we don't believe in it. We protect the data privacy of our contractors and our contractor partners. Uh, with the utmost security. Uh, the other big thing I, we do that's a little bit different, we use psychometric testing. So uh, with all the folks that work for us, we test their innate behavioral drives, and then we do some job analysis based on what you want our teams to do. And then I'm aligning people to work that feels fulfilling, exciting, and engaging for them. And that's something in general that I would suggest as a practice for anybody, right? You'll be amazed at when we have work that's exciting for us, like, hey, you'll never work a day in your life if you love what you do. Bullshit. That, is a bullshit phrase. But if you love what you do, you will seek that workout even if you're tired. So even if you know, you're run down at 7.30 PM, right? Because it's exciting and it draws you. I'm going to call my sales manager right now and talk to him about a couple of things. I'm going to bounce a couple ideas off the CEO. I'm going to look into this one thing that I, you know, I've been chewing on for a while because this work is exciting and it fuels me. Even though it's work and even though I might get tired and even though I might have bad days, right? It fuels me and it drives me. And that's true of all the folks that we put in our roles. So like, as an example, you know, attrition across the BPO industry is about 63%. Ours is 4%. Uh, the last person we lost, uh, we lost in September. And we lost him because he became the chief technology officer for our client and immigrated to the United States. 
Uh, so uh, it's about you know creating competitive cultures that really push our teams to drive forward, but enable our clients to be ultra successful. Dude, that's awesome. I love that. Uh, BPO, Adam's mentioned a few times for the audience, business process outsourcing, right? Am I correct on that? That's exactly right. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> all right. So you have all these processes and you can just put them in a big pile and just give them over to Adam and his team and they'll take care of them. But that's huge because I mean, it, 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 I've had experience hiring people, two people last year as the owner of the company, I hired two people and they're no longer with us. And part of the reason is because we did not have the systems to help them be successful in those roles. Because for both those positions, it was the first time we ever hired for those positions. So just like, yeah, come on board and just kind of shadow me. We'll figure it out. And you know, we just did not set that up for winning. Uh, this year, we're hiring for those positions again, and we are super dialed in on that. So that is a big thing. A lot of companies don't realize, like, if you're going to hire someone, you need to have a, a system to make them successful and take ownership over that. And a lot there's no there's a lack of ownership in this industry and across all industries, I think. So this kind of helps to solve that problem. Symptom of, again, a symptom of high noise, high velocity business, right? Everyone needs so much all the time that, hey, my bookkeeper saying, I can't possibly do all this in a week. It'd help me to have one person to do this one thing. Can you go hire someone, right? Now we think, what, 25 bucks an hour? Yeah, whatever. Sure, I'll go, I'll go find and hire. And then, you know, we figure that they'll just find other stuff for them to do. There's so much stuff that has to happen in this business anyways. And that person's working 15 or 20 hours a week and they're there for seven months and they're bored out of their mind and they quit. Yeah. Right. Then I'm starting that process all over again because I haven't really diligently thought through. So that is a, you know, it's a prime example. We had a, one roofing client that, uh, in my consulting practice that, you know, said, Hey, I'm about to hire my sixth accountant in a year and a half. Um, I, I don't know why I keep going through people every three months for this role. Can you help me understand? I said, that's interesting. <laughs> Let's peel the onion back. Right. And it was a job that I would last two weeks in. It was, you know, highly repetitive, systematic, boring work. It was also work kind of anybody could do. Right. And if you could, so our teams take, I have this idea and then they go back for four weeks and build a 200 page training manual on how we're going to run that idea effectively and efficiently every time. And you know, at the core, that's what it's about. You know, asking yourself, is this something that I need someone in the office every day in order to do or achieve this job? Or is this kind of something that anybody could do? And we, we look at it through, by the way, through an equation. And this is, again, this would be true of us. This is probably true of most you know, uh, outsourcing firms, on average, the cost of hiring one US entry level or administrative hire, you can hire a team of three people in the Philippines uh, that will have the work productivity output of six folks. So um, if you could hire six people to accomplish what one person would domestically and you get no health insurance, there's no uh, liability for employment lawsuit, there's no liability for, uh, you know, early termination, I'm guaranteed the hours. So if one person leaves, they are required to put another body on that account with redundancy. So it's someone else who knows how we do it. There's zero risk. So, and that's where I get to your risk, you know, to hire overseas has got to substantially outweigh your risk to hire domestically. And it's hard to find that balance ever. Right, right. That's, that's great. So when a company works with you guys, are they contracting with SMA or directly with the people in the Philippines. Yep. They're contracting directly with SMA and all of our fees are rolled into the hourly cost for that team. Love so. it. Okay. That makes a lot of sense. Cool. So yeah, guys, I mean, the audience just might sound maybe like a little bit like a sales pitch for SMA. It's really not. We're just digging into some of these common problems that we see every single day with all size companies. I mean, we have you know, Adam, you've worked with some giant companies. So do we? Same problems exist, right? Uh, just because you know, you're big doesn't mean you figured out all these problems. So we just want to unpack like kind of how this is done, how you can do it, whether it's SMA or someone else, uh, or whether you are hiring someone in person, because maybe that's your culture and that's what you want to do. That's cool too. But just know how to like get some of this stuff off your plate so that you can free yourself up to be that visionary and to grow, you know, to grow that yeah. company that you want. Yeah. When you're, whenever you're hiring, there are certain things that I would call foundational rules. And I appreciate if you are hiring domestically, certain foundational rules that I encourage you to apply to your business. The first is for every single new hire, you should not only, they need a hiring manager, et cetera, who they're going to report to a team. You've also got to give them a new hire onboarding buddy. So, and, and very honestly, if they're like administrative or operation or production, it should be someone in a different department, but that knows their world fairly well. You want to give them an out. You want to give a, someone else in your organization, an opportunity to develop some leadership skills that they otherwise wouldn't get access to. So they can have a chance to feel like, geez, like leading and compelling and driving is fun for me. But you also want to give that person someone that is zero threat and zero risk for them to say, I'm having the worst time in my onboarding experience. 
right? They're not going to tell their manager ever. They're never going to tell HR. They're never going to tell you the owner. Uh, but they could probably tell a friend that takes them out to get a drink once a week, right? They could probably tell their friend that might go for a ride along with them in their work. It might go out to lunch every once a month. Just check in and touch base to say, geez, I'm frustrated or concerned about this. And you can begin to triage issues proactively within your business rather than a reactive. We're 75 days in. We weren't organized for Jane. She's ready to quit. What are we going to do? You know, when all the levers that we would pull, right, think about driving these big organizational outcomes, the one that always had the most impact on companies was talent every time. So, uh, and the culture and the environment you create. Awesome. Onboarding buddy. Is that what you said? Yeah. Onboarding buddy. Yeah. Ah, I love that. All right, cool. You got all these awesome phrases, man. So you mentioned Adam, you mentioned the sales, uh, the sales rep, right? Freeing that sales rep up to go out and focus on revenue generating activities. That's an awesome example. Uh, you mentioned the accounting example. Can you give us a few more examples of things that you see across roofing and contracting companies that yeah. can easily be outsourced? Yeah. You know, big, there are big things. There are things like, you know, city permits, so like tracking jobs that need final inspection, following up with the city inspectors, sending emails to the city for additional documents, rebate tracking. You know, the big one for me is AR. AR is huge. So AR looks like, you know, not only contacting mortgage companies for insurance depreciation or lease checks, but contacting homeowners to say, hey, the mortgage company is going to drop a check to you that they've signed over and should be there on Tuesday. Any reason that Joe, your sales rep, can't come by and pick that up on Tuesday that day, right? I think every roofing company owner can remember a time perhaps where we didn't get a check for two months and then that homeowner's boiler blew out. And now all of a sudden we weren't getting paid in the roof because we forgot to go get those funds. Right. Your AR is critical in balancing and managing your AR is critical. In the minute that that begins to slip, because you think I'm just going to go sell another roof, whatever. Right. That pro <laughs> problem snowballs substantially. So having somebody that could take ownership of that A and B can help you begin to proactively understand the issues so that, you know, your payment delays don't roll into something that they don't have to do. Mm, so. Absolutely. I've seen companies go out of business because they grow too fast. They, they outsell, you know, they, they just run out of cash. Right. Because especially with storm restoration, takes a, you know, could take a little while to get your money. And so yeah. you can't cover that gap there. That's huge. And man, I've been through that. That's why I raised my hand when I was handling all the finances and AR and everything. Like I would let things slip through the cracks or, you know, credit cards get declined. I just never follow up with the client. And, you know, before you know it, you're in multiple five, six figures, you know, in AR and you're not going to collect all that. And uh, we just had a client go through that recently. I think it was like two or 300 grand that they forgot. They just forgot to bill for because they're going so fast, right? So they're, they're trying to chase that now, but man, that's big money. It's good luck. It is, it's your money and you should part. And, and by the way, those con calls, those phone calls are uncomfortable. If I've hired a rep and that rep's idea of that job is I'm going to have cool conversations with wonderful people I get to help and support all day long. Uh, they're probably going to avoid the uncomfortable phone calls. That's why I always did it. Yeah. Yep. Not do it or tell you, oh, they didn't answer. Right. So can you give that work to someone, you know, will do that work consistently and proactively. And, and again, you know, managing that outstanding AR. If you're thinking about scaling a company up and your vision is like, I know private equity money's rolling in here. You're going to look at your outstanding AR, your 90 day balance. You're going to get arbitraged heavy on that. Awesome. All right, quick pause from our conversation with Adam. Hope you guys are really enjoying this. Adam is talking a lot about the value that processes and systems bring to a business. Whether you're looking to eventually sell your business, package it up and sell it, or whether you want to keep it as a lifelong asset that produces revenue and profit and consistency and provides a lifestyle that you want. Either way, that's up to you. However, one of the things that Adam keeps talking about is the value of processes to drive revenue, to drive consistency, to drive profit. What we do here at Contractor Dynamics is we are a marketing training company. So what we do all day, every day is we train roofing companies on how to do their own marketing, how to build their own marketing machine, how to run their own marketing in-house so that every roofing company that works with us inside our marketing training programs has a system and a process for continuously running their own content, their own marketing, their own ads, for tracking and measuring their own marketing, for calculating ROI, for doubling down on marketing, for growing, scaling their advertising, for working with different vendors and whatnot. They have that control over their marketing and then they have that control over their growth. Marketing does not solve every problem in a business. I wish it did, but it's a big domino. So if you've been spraying and praying with your marketing dollars, or if you're just throwing a bunch of money out there, you have no idea what you're doing and you wanna learn how to like deploy your, your time, your money, your energy, your resources, Sources, your people into marketing so you can actually get a predictable ROI. That's exactly what we train you to do. We train you on how to do your own marketing. So if you want to learn any more about that, reach out to us at any time at contractordynamics.com or smash the link below this audio or video. We'll be happy to get on a call with you and walk through that to help you transform and grow. 
All right, cool. Adam, you brought that up. I wanted to bring that up uh, inside this hour. You mentioned PE, private equity, a lot going on there these days. I, I assume you've seen, you know, some some inside deals and whatnot. Give us kind of like a 30,000 foot view of like what a private equity company is looking for in terms of like, hey, is this company all processed out? They have training manuals. Like how valuable is that in the evaluation of a company? Yeah. So there's one statement that I give folks every time as I'm giving them advice or guidance about starting the process of due diligence or looking at private equity money, right? And I tell them to think, hey, this is my business. My business is a machine. I understand how to steer my machine, to improve my machine, to transform my machine. And I understand how to manage my machine to a successful economic outcome. And here is the data that proves it. That at its heart is what you are there to do. There are three big things that I think that every roofing owner needs to know that private equity is going to care a lot about. Uh, and the first of those that I don't hear talked about a lot are compound annual growth rate. So your compound annual growth rate is how much am I growing in market year over year for my business? What it's going to suggest to me as an outside investor is how viable is your business model long term, right? I.e., hey, you've been in Indianapolis for eight years. In year one, you grew 100%. Year one, two, you grew 70 then 40, then 15, then 10. Some of that's going to be scale, right? But if I think that your growth is slowing beyond just your ability to scale up in total revenue, while I'm watching similar things happening in other markets, it might point to a flaw in your business model and it might give me a moment to pause. Uh, the second big thing that I tell every business owner to think about is EBITDA. I mean, EBITDA is really like 1A, right? You want your EBITDA margin to be, to be high, 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 as high as possible. And that looks like generally, right, like reducing your overhead expenditures. That looks like maximizing margin on your jobs, on your roles. I'll tell you what, a, as an outside investor is going to be 500 times more interested in a $8 million roofer at 40% EBITDA than a $20 million roofer at 4% EBITDA. They're not going to care about your top line revenue if you're not making money. True. They don't care. Uh, and they're particularly not going to care if a lot of that selling is still happening amongst, you know, hey, me and my president of sales and our good buddy from college, right? They're not buying you, they're buying your business. So they're going to want to see that there's effective sell through that's happening at a layer of that company. And the last thing they're going to look at to that end is revenue per full time employee. They're going to want to make sure that are you sized and staffed appropriately? They're, prob they're going to unpack what you're paying individuals. Because, i.e., if you're underpaying your staff and your team today, they're going to arbitrage you on that to say, well, mm, I'm not going to give you this much because I'm going to have to raise the comp for these seven people because you're not paying them enough, right? So we got to bring them in line with market. Or they're going to say, well, yeah, I'm probably not going to give you this much because I'm sure Susan's doing culture and finance and accounting and operations and all these wonderful things. But, and I'm sure it's eight jobs, but you've got to list his office and culture manager on this. And those folks don't tend to make $150,000. Right. So your comp plans are out of balance and out of line. So comp reviews, I think, are important and kind of right sizing your roles are pretty, pretty critically important. But it's all going to be about efficiency. You know, business is one in the margins. Right. So am I cultivating my sales and marketing funnel as effectively as I can? Do I have any kind of recurring revenue model? Right. If I were a roofer, the first thing I would do today is build, build a service contract. Five hundred dollars a year. I'm going to that will cover any repair up to a thousand dollars. It guarantees two free inspections during the course of the year. Really, I'm just putting you back at the top of my sales funnel. So, right, whatever. But it's what it is from the business, from the investor side is it's recurring, it's free money. It's recurring revenue. So if I'm a $10 million roofer and I can sell 30% of my deals on a $500 a year service contract that are going to pump all of that money back in in the sales funnel, like that is really attractive to me, <laughs> right? That's a business that can make money no matter what, even if there aren't storms. Oh, absolutely. I mean, we're not a roofing company, uh, but we have a recurring revenue model as to you guys, I'm sure. And it's awesome. Helps you sleep better at night because you have that consistency, predictability. You're able to hire, you're able to invest in your business. You're able to, you know, create budgets accordingly, man. It's, it's, uh, it's pretty amazing. So yeah, sorry, you know, we'll take the big thing. It takes your multiplier from, you know, four to eight X to nine to 15 X even. So four to eight, cool. So for the audience that might not know what you're talking about there in terms of a multiplier, can you just dig into that a little bit? Yes. Yeah, so so oftentimes when we're going through our final kind of our cash out, uh, when we're getting a round of investment or funding from an outside bank, uh, they're going to build a valuation of your business that is generally uh, a multiple of your annual EBITDA. Um, so service-based, project-based companies, uh, they're a 
tons of variables that go into the way that they use those multipliers. A lot of you might have heard five to 10. And I'm going to tell you it's closer to four to eight. Um, lots of folks standing in that six, seven, eight range. If you can add in recurring revenue, you change the dynamic of that multiplier substantially, and you can start to get into the nine, 12, 15 X, right? So do I want to get six X, four and a half million dollars? Or do I want 15 X, four and a half million dollars is my valuation. Yeah. Substantial. Makes it simple. Yeah. So let's break that down. All right. So we have a $10 million a uh, year revenue company. We're at say 20% EBITDA, uh, just call it, you know, 2 million bucks, right? So we're talking the difference between 2 million times four to eight, or let's call it, let's call it six, right? Yeah. So it's a different million versus 30 million bucks. Yeah. Uh, 2 million times 15, 30 million bucks. Like that's a significant difference. So invest in those things now. What else, Adam? We got a few minutes. What else do you want to kind of impart on our audience before we uh, hop off today? Yeah. I mean, your great equalizer is, is talent. At the end of the day, your great equalizer is talent. And it's on you to make sure that the talent is kind of empowered and focused in the right ways and in the right places. If you look at your PL, what do you spend more money on than anything else, right? And unless you've got no employees, which is unlikely, right? It's your talent. Uh, in particular, for those guys who are two, three, four million dollar roofers, it's the people you hire. It's the sales reps that last 60 days and quit, right? But you, like, if you can solve the talent challenge, you will win the battle. You've got, you know, the core ingredients to have hyper successful businesses exist just by nature in this space. Uh, and the most important thing you can do is build a talent funnel and a talent program uh, that drives and optimizes your success. And so that means you're hiring right, you're advertising your jobs appropriately, you've got an employer brand that talks about what it's like to work for you that sits alongside your consumer brand, right? But it also means that you're designing jobs and you're designing your organization appropriately. So you're giving people work that feels strategic, that feels exciting, that moves the needle. Uh, and you're clearing all that things, all those kind of moments of weakness about work that none of us really like all that much, you're getting them out of the way and you're finding an efficient, effective, and low risk way to offshore those. So I love that. I love that. One of our key metrics that we track here is our total cost of people as a percentage of revenue. So that ratio. And, you know, we, we kind of know when it's getting too high, that maybe we're overstaffed, maybe we're a little bit inefficient. We need to build in more efficiency to get that ratio down to where we want it. But for a people heavy business, like that's that's the main thing that that one of the main things that we track. So yeah, Adam, awesome, awesome stuff here. I want to wrap up, want to be respectful of your time. You dropped a lot of bombs today. I've dropped a lot of nuggets here. I know you're going to provide a lot of value for our audience. What's the best way for someone to learn more about, about you guys, SMA support, how to just kind of dig into this a little bit more? Yeah, sure. So I encourage everybody to go to our social media pages at uh, SMA support or SMA support US. We give a lot of what we call give the game away for free. So yep. we're always trying to give content away that can kind of help empower your businesses, get you to think a little bit differently, think outside the box. If you want to check us out, you're welcome to come Look at our website, uh, smasupport.us. Send me an email, adam.patterson at smasupport.us. Um, always happy to chat, but we've got a little bit of a form fill on our website and um, more than happy to respond. Awesome, Adam. Well, thank you so much, man. I've learned a lot. I've taken some notes. I know our audience has too, so I appreciate you coming on. Thanks so much. We appreciate it. Thank you so much, Joe. Did you guys learn something? I learned a lot. I took lots of notes. My, again, my wheels are spinning on what we can implement here at Contractor Dynamics and what we can help our clients implement as well. If you guys want to get in touch with Adam, we'll include his link below, SMA support. Now I know that some, and I even mentioned it during the episode, guys, some of that uh, may have sounded like a sales pitch for SMA support. I was just asking those questions because I was curious and I just got to know Adam this week. Although I've known the owner, Joe Hoffman, for many, many years. A lot of you in the roofing industry know Joe as well. Really good people. With any situation like this where we have a guest on, guys, I want to always be upfront with you whenever there is a partnership, a relationship, a uh, financial incentive for me to like recommend someone. And I want that to be as pure as possible. So I want to let you guys know that there is no incentive financial or otherwise for me or Contractor Dynamics to, to recommend SMA support. The reality is that when we find companies like this who have that domain knowledge, who really understand the roofing and contracting industry, and they have a great product and they have great people, which is the most important thing. Then we stand behind those people. We want to build relationships with them and we want to push them out to you guys because our mission is to equip you with the tools to transform and grow. And I really believe that this is a, uh, you know, whether you reach out to SMA or not, but this concept is something that's going to separate the guys, the companies that are really growing and thriving over the next five or 10 years. You know, these concepts of technology, processes, automation, outsourcing, the companies that really embrace that stuff are going to continue to crush it. And the companies that don't 
they're at risk for maybe not surviving and thriving, right? So just wanna share that with you guys. Again, if you got value out of this, I'd appreciate you sharing it out with your network. Screenshot it, put in your stories, text it to someone, email to someone, drop a comment below. Let us know what value you got from it. And also please make sure you hit the subscribe button. We've got a ton of content coming to you guys every single week. Wanna make sure that you get as much value as possible. So please subscribe, YouTube, podcast, wherever you're listening, watching this. We genuinely appreciate it. Hope you got a lot of value out of this and we'll see you soon.